And the first four of them, creation, corruption, which would be the fall of man, catastrophe, which would be the flood of Noah, and then confusion, which would be the Tower of Babel, all those are part of the history and narrative that's in the Bible, and they're all very foundational to a lot of things um, that we learn about in, in scientific disciplines, such as geology, paleontology, anthropology, sociology, psychology, all those aspects are really founded in a biblical worldview and uh, starting with these aspects of creation. The other reason that this, another reason this is important is that these, our, many of our doctrines, many of our Bible doctrines are anchored and founded again in Genesis. And um, I show here a picture of, of building blocks and so forth, and there's nine of them here. Uh, but you know, basic things like human life, sin, uh, the dominion mandate, the gospel, and so forth, all those things are anchored in uh, the word of God in Genesis. And if we don't believe that Adam was a real man, if we don't believe in the Genesis account, the, the, the younger creation, then really we make these doctrines meaningless, or at least the foundation of them becomes meaningless. Another aspect of this issue is that it answers qu basic questions of life. You know, where did I come from? And uh, of course, we're, we know that from the Bible, we're made in the image of God. But if I believe in evolution, uh, then basically I'm an evolved animal. And there's a huge difference between those two, and of course it affects a lot of things. Another a question it answers is, uh, what is the purpose of life? And as Christians, um, we know that uh, God creates us for a purpose, on purpose, with a purpose, and so forth. Um, if evolution is true, we're just evolved animals, uh, came up from the slime, and so forth. There's really no purpose in life. And unfortunately, I think a lot of young people are getting that message in their education system, and that's probably why we have a lot of problems in our schools. Speaking of the youth, the statistics are pretty distressing. About 70 to 80 percent of the youth are stepping away from the faith. I'm talking about Christian youth when they go to the university. So that's a you know that's a huge percentage of young people who are just leaving the faith when they get to the university. And there's a lot of reasons why that is. But some of the uh, one of the main reasons is science, quote unquote. And uh, Pew Research did a study: 50 percent of um, uh, young people say they don't believe it anymore, and science is the top reason for that. 75% uh, say that science has essentially discredited the Bible. And of course, when they say science, they're talking about evolution. They're, they're not talking about true science. They're talking about the theory of evolution. Um, but the problem's not getting any better because the Generation Z, which is the generation, uh, the, the latest generation, the youngest generation, that's our our high schoolers, or college students. Generation Z, about 35% of them say they have no affiliation with any uh, religion whatsoever. We call them nuns. They have no affiliation. And uh, Barna called that generation the first post-Christian generation. So we've got our work cut out for us if we want to reach the young people, because that's, of course, the future uh, of our country, of our faith. As I said earlier, most uh, a lot of, probably most Bible colleges, Bible professors, theologians don't believe in a young earth creation. And this is just one quote from uh, William Lane Craig, who is, a, a, of course, a theologian. He says, 50% of evangelical pastors think that the world is less than 10,000 years old. That is just hugely embarrassing. Scientifically, it's nonsense. And again, he's just being sucked into the mainstream science, which believes in evolution, but it's not true science. Here's a couple of other evangelical leaders. Uh, Tim Keller says one must reject science in order to believe the Bible. And of course, he's talking about believing in the literal uh, creation uh, narrative. John Piper says, uh, you know, the earth is billions of years old if it wants to be. It is whatever science says. So again, what's happening is that these uh, Christian leaders are putting science ahead of the word of God. We, it's, it's a matter of uh, authority. And what they do then is they try to combine. These, uh, these uh, leaders will try to combine uh, evolution and the Bible. And uh, there's several different ways they do that. I list four here. These are the four main ways that they do that. I'm sure most of you have heard, heard of these. Um, the last two I'll touch on briefly. 
um, the gap theory and the day-age theory. <clears throat> the gap theory says that there was a gap of time between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, and a lot of things happened then. Lucifer, Satan uh, rebelled. Uh, there was uh, millions of years, fossils and all that. Uh, just between those first two verses. But of course, that contradicts the Bible when the Bible says in Romans 5.12 that it's because of Adam's sin that death came into the world. So how could you have all this death, this struggle, disease, fossils, and so forth before Adam? So biblically, it's, it's not, uh, not going to work. <clears throat> when it comes to the day-age theory, um, I think this quote is pretty telling. This is... Uh, James Barr, who is an Oxford professor of Hebrew, and he says basically no legitimate professor of Hebrew is going to say that the days in Genesis 1 are not literal 24-hour days. So he says basically all your Hebrew scholars agree that those were literal 24-hour days. <clears throat> There's a lot of other reasons also, by the way, that um, the day-age theory is, is uh, incorrect, uh, but I don't have time to get into them right now. Um, I do have, obviously, a bunch of talks that I do and, and available for, and we'll get into that in one of my talks. Um, so what does it boil down to, kind of? It boils down to a matter of authority. What is our authority? Is our authority the Word of God, or is our authority man's uh, theories? And like I showed you with those uh, other uh, evangelical leaders, they're putting man's science above the plain teaching of the Word of God. Jesus said, if you believe not Moses, and Moses, of course, wrote Genesis, inspired to write Genesis, how shall you believe my words? You know, we can't pick and choose. It's not right for us to pick and choose what parts of the Bible we want to believe. Um, how, how can we believe if it's not right for us to believe in the miracle of the resurrection, but not to believe in the miracle of creation? So, <clears throat> What I want to point out now is that this is a matter of worldviews. It's not a matter of religion versus science. You hear that all the time. Well, creation, that's religion. We're, we're dealing with science here with evolution. That's not the case. It's a, it's a worldview. It's a belief system um, issue, belief system debate, if you will. And in creation, we believe by faith in the word of God, in the Bible. We believe in God as the creator. In evolution, they believe by faith that things came about by time and chance and their faith is in their theory uh, of evolution. And to underscore that, I'll give you a couple of quotes here. Um, Michael Ruse, uh, Department of Philosophy at the University of Guelph in Ontario said, evolution is basically a secular religion, a full-fledged uh, alternate to Christianity. <clears throat> Another quote by an evolutionist, Richard Lawanton. We take the side of science, again, he's talking about evolution, in spite of the absurdity of some of its constructs, its, its uh, uh, concepts and ideas. Well, why do they do that? Because we have a prior commitment to materialism, and we can't let a divine foot in the door. So, you know, a lot of these people, they're, they're honest here in saying that, you know, we're, we're never going to believe in creation because that's going to allow a divine foot in the door. <coughs> So to go over a few items of, of science that, you know, a lot of times creationists are accused of, of not being scientific, uh, there's actually some very recent science I'll show you um, that supports creation and uh, shows how evolution is just not possible. But it's like cutting edge research being done in the last year or two. <clears throat> but the heavens declare the glory of God, it says in Psalm 19.1. These are a list, and I know in the back you probably can't read them, but real quickly I'll go over, you know, spiral galaxies, we know they cannot last as long. The evolutionist says the universe is 13.8 billion years old. Um, there's no way that spiral, we know that spiral galaxies can maintain their shape uh, that long. Uh, there are what they what are called retrograde orbits or uh, rotations of planets and so forth. Uh, Venus rotates backwards. Uh, there are half of the uh, moons of Jupiter orbit the, the, the uh, planet Jupiter backwards, so to speak. These are called retrograde orbits um, or rotations. That's impossible with the way the Big Bang Theory is uh, developed. 
Big Bang Theory says everything developed through nebula, nebula clouds and so forth, and everything has to rotate the same direction. So what, they have a problem here, but they, can't, they cannot um, explain that. Uh, comets, comets do not last as long as uh, they say the solar system's age is. Uh, they only last uh, maybe tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of years. Um, the faint young sun paradox, uh, basically the sun is actually getting uh, brighter and brighter. We don't notice it, but um, if you go back 13 or four and a half billion years, which is what they say the solar system is, uh, the sun would have been too cold to um, allow life to develop. Um, the Earth's rotation is slowing down and the moon is receding. All these things, if you try to take them back several billion years, uh, the Earth would be rotating too fast, the moon would be too close to the Earth. Um, all these things don't work when you try to crank in the billions of years of evolution. <clears throat> and then the last thing, the heat sources and magnetic fields were recently discovered over the last 10 or 20 years in the outer planets. The evolutionists did not expect this, but creationists did, obviously because of the time frame. If you're talking about 6,000 years, um, the planets can maintain a heat source and magnetic fields for that period of time. If you're talking about billions of years, it's impossible. <clears throat> well, with all these problems with the Big Bang Theory, there are scientists who are actually coming together and, and uh, questioning the theory <coughs> itself. And uh, E-Learner and, and several other scientists said in the New Scientist, the Big Bang relies on a number of things we have never observed. In no other field of physics would this be accepted. It would raise serious questions about the validity of the theory. So they're questioning the Big Bang Theory uh, because of these problems. The origin of life is probably the biggest um, Achilles heel to evolution. There's no legitimate scientist who has an explanation for the origin of life. Obviously, we creationists believe God created life. <coughs> Some of you may remember from your science textbooks this picture. This, there was an experiment done by a couple of men named Miller and Urey <coughs> years ago in the 50s, I think, um, where they tried to replicate what they thought was the early Earth's atmosphere and oceans and so forth and, and try to produce life. Well, they did produce a few amino acids, but nothing close to uh, a protein, which is a building block of life. And they saw this, and scientists understand this now. In fact, Yuri, one of the men that did this experiment, he's, he's just come out and said, all of us who study the origin of life uh, know and feel it's too complex to have evolved. Uh, we all believe, as an article of faith, that life evolves. So again, the idea that evolution is science and creation is religion is nonsense. It's a belief system, and just like he says here, we. We know that it couldn't have evolved, so we believe by faith that uh, evolution occurred. <coughs> what about the diversity? And, and so bottom line is nobody knows, no, no, there's no natural um, answer for the <coughs> origin of life. Uh, so they just skip over that, and then they start talking about mutations and changes and, and how we got the diversity of life. <coughs> And again, here's the two worldviews looking at the evidence from two different directions. And the evolutionists on the left will say, oh yeah, everything came from a common ancestor, a common uh, amoeba or one-celled animal or whatever, and everything evolved up from that. Um, the creationist, the one on the right, would say, yeah, uh, common kinds, <coughs> common kinds. And this is kind of a picture of that. On the left, you see the, what they call the tree of life, which is everything evolved up from a single uh, amoeba or something. On the right, though, we have what we call the orchard of life. And that's really what did happen. Uh, when the animals came off the ark, um, God had made, you know, sent all the different kinds of animals onto the ark. So those kinds then speciated, and we have all kinds of dogs, we have all kinds of horses, we have all kinds of uh, other, other animals, but each kind came off the ark and procreated and then speciated, and so we call it an orchard uh, of life. And that, you'll notice that the evidence is the same. You just look and see the diversity of life. But the evolutionist takes it all the way back to one celled animal, whereas the creationists take it to different kinds of animals that were, uh, that God created. When the uh, scientists look at 
uh, genetics. For this, they, they claim, oh yeah, genetics, that proves evolution. Actually, it proves creation. Um, because they have to come up with a whole bunch of mutations in order to explain the diversity of life. Um, whereas we creationists uh, believe that it was simply um, adaptability that was designed in by God. Okay, So when you look at the DNA, which is extremely complex, and there's no way that it could have evolved because it's information, and information is abstract, it's not naturalism or materialism. Another problem uh, with the diversity of life and mutations and so forth is a thing called irreducible complexity, which um, basically says that different traits of animals, uh, generally there's a, a function, has several parts to it. And all those parts have to come together at the same time in order for that function to work. You can't have one, uh, a bunch of small incremental mutations line up uh, to form that function. They all have to come together at the same time. That's called irreducible complexity. A couple of examples are the bombardier beetle. Bombardier beetle has two chemicals that it mixes and shoots out a hot uh, gas to repel its uh, predators. Um, obviously, if that little bug tried to evolve those chemicals, he would have blown himself up too much. Um, the other picture on the right there is a bacterial flagellum, which is basically a molecular outboard motor. And there's actually that from the far right a picture, a, a electron microscope <coughs> picture of that motor. And it's got all the parts um, to it. Uh, and so these are things that had to all be in place together. They couldn't have been evolved through mutations uh, one at a time. The thing about mutations, though, is that they're rare, and they're usually harmful. And when we're talking about using mutations as a mechanism for evolution or natural selection, mutations have to be beneficial. And you have to have a lot of them to keep trying to get the right ones. Um, they must be in the same, in the proper sequence uh, for a new trait to form, if, if it doesn't have to be all together with irreducible complexity. Another big thing about the new traits is it's new information. When you have one, if you supposedly, according to evolution, have one kind of animal evolving into another, you have new traits. But new traits means new information. And again, there's no physical, there's no natural way in which information uh, comes about uh, by uh, natural means. So the bottom line is, is there's not enough time uh, for all these mutations to come together to Pick, uh, to give the traits to some new animal that has uh, a benefit to its species, and so nature can select it. And natural selection or nature selecting is kind of a misnomer because nature doesn't select, organisms adapt. And that's the term that I like to use and creationists use often is adaptability. And that's designed adaptability or engineered adaptability by God. <coughs> The new research now in epigenetics, it's called epigenetics, and this is, this is really incredible, it's very interesting. Um, genes express themselves differently. So you can have the same set of genes, but they may produce uh, different traits depending on how they're expressed. And this is called epigenetics, and it's designed into the DNA. There's no changes, no mutations, nothing needs to change in the DNA. It's already designed in. And it, 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 the genes get expressed based on how the environment um, impacts that organism. So, for example, if an organism is in a very cold environment, then the genes expressing for longer hair or more fur or whatever would come to the front. And here's some examples of very, very recent research on epigenetics. Uh, they have found that cave fish, when they move from outside of a cave into a cave, will lose their eyesight in one generation. The, the genes are expressed in such a way that they don't have eyes uh, in, in the cave. Now, when they go from the cave back out of the cave, in one generation, they'll gain their eyes back. Um, Darwin's finches, you've heard of those. Um, they've actually done new research to show that the, their beaks changed in, uh, in about two years. It took about two years for the adaptability to modify their, their beaks so that they could uh, get that get the food that they need. 
And this last one's pretty interesting. Carpfish, um, their predator is a pipefish. And when a pipefish, if, if pipefish get into an area and start eating carp, they're, um, they're expelling um, in their digestive system the remains or the smell or whatever of the carp so that the carp, they're still alive, are act actually change shape. And these, these genes are expressed to change their shape so they're harder to catch. The, the pike would uh, find it harder to catch them. So these are just incredible uh, epigenetic <coughs> research that's, that's been done very recently. And again, it all goes back to design adaptability rather than this long problem of uh, mutations and natural selection. Um, another aspect of uh, creation and versus evolution, again, the two world views, is the world population. Now, the evolutionist says that Homo sapiens has been around for about 200,000 years. Well, as far as they're concerned, there was no growth in the population for about 190,000 years of the 200. Huh. Only in the last 10,000 years have we begin to see growth in population, they say. Uh, but again, when we use a creationist worldview and a creationist framework that man has been around for 6,000 years and actually mankind has really only come from the ark 4,400 years ago or so, eight people off the ark 4,400 years ago and then till today's seven plus billion people, that's, it's averaged about a one half a percent annual growth, which is very, very reasonable. 35 year generations, maybe 2.2 children, that kind of thing. Extremely reasonable. <coughs> Uh, whereas the evolutionist has to come up with this idea that, oh, no, there's no growth for 190,000 years. <clears throat> Another aspect of this, which is very interesting, again, very recent research by um, Nathaniel Jensen of uh, uh, Institute for Creation Research. He's a, got a PhD from Harvard in genetics, and he's done research on human mitochondrial DNA. Now, mitochondrial DNA comes down through the mothers, through the, through the females. But he did... Um, a study on the number of mutations that would be expected in the mitochondrial DNA. And he predicted there'd be about 80. The evolutionary uh, framework predicted about 470 because it's a much longer time frame. Well, in actuality, there are about 80. So again, here's research that just completely supports uh, creation and we don't have to even uh, debunk evolution, it just supports creation. The other interesting thing in that picture, if you can see, that when he mapped out the uh, DNA mutations that they clustered in three lineages. Now, if you think about it, who came off the ark? You know, three daughters. And so those three lineages uh, match very nicely with three uh, daughters uh, who came off the ark, the, the, the wives of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. <clears throat> when it comes to geology and fossils, um, we know, of course, that fossils um, must be formed rapidly, otherwise they would just decay or be scavenged. They have to be buried quickly and so forth. And you've seen examples of fish eating and other fish when it got buried. Um, also, fossils are found on tops of mountains all around the world, including the Himalayas. And um, so that would point to what? A global flood, a flood that covered the whole Earth. Now, obviously, the Himalaya mountains were not as high back then than they are now. What happened was the waters covered all the, all the mountains, it calls high hills too, so we don't know how high they were, but maybe a few thousand feet. Um, when the waters receded off of the continents after the flood, the what's called isostatic rebound, the, the um, continents would actually raise up. And the, the weight of the water came off the continents, the, uh, uh, the mantle would push up on the crust, and, and the mountains actually rose. And the Bible actually talks about that in uh, Psalm 104. <clears throat> so we look at fossils. What's the evidence? The evidence is that we've got a bunch of fossils in layers of rock. And for the most part, um, your smaller uh, marine type fossils are near the bottom. And, and you get to vertebrates and, and um, land animals further uh, up in the layers. So the evolutionist says, oh yeah, that shows time. You know, that's millions of years. That's, that's the animals evolving into new animals. Um, 
But the creation says, no, that's not what it is. Here's the evidence. The way we interpret it is we're talking about a one-year flood, and the animals got buried in different ecological zones. So naturally, the uh, marine animals would be buried first. All the, the sediments going around with the flood and, and all these marine animals, you know, clams can't run very fast, you know, so they get caught in the, in the sediments. And 95% of the fossils are marine uh, invertebrates, by the way. Um, so we have some uh, other animals further, further up in the layers, uh, maybe land animals, um, dinosaurs, and so forth. But they were more mobile, and they could probably try to escape the flood waters as they rose, but eventually got caught. So it's an ecological zone interpretation that we uh, creationists uh, go with. And this is just kind of a picture of it. On the left, you see the uh, geologic time scale. And on the right, we have the waters rising, and then the waters falling and receding off the continents. And then right after that, we have the Ice Age. And there's uh, a very good creationist explanation for the Ice Age, which I don't have time to get into, but the evolutionists have no explanation for how the Ice Age occurred. And in fact, they say there were multiple Ice Ages over millions of years, but there's, there's really no evidence for that. All the evidence of the Ice Age can be put with one Ice Age, and we believe it occurred after the flood. One other problem evolutionists have is what's called the Cambrian Explosion. There's a lot of life, a lot of fossils, uh, complex fossils, really, um, that are buried in the very bottom layer of the rock strata. So uh, you don't have you don't have this very 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 simple. They may have been marine invertebrates, but they're really not simple uh, animals. Uh, the trilobite, which is one of the um, well, this isn't really good, but uh, the trilobite um, has a compound eye like insects. It's, they're actually pretty complex. All this uh, all these animals are found at the bottom layer. Um, it's called the Cambrian Explosion. You talk about transitional forms. Um, there are none that have really been found. Again, you look at uh, Archaeopteryx, for example, and the evolution will say, oh yeah, that's a transitional form. That's a reptile turning into birds. In fact, it's so crazy uh, that um, scientists are beginning, are, are now classifying birds as dinosaurs. They don't even have them as a separate uh, order or whatever. Um, but the creationists will say, no, that's an extinct bird. It happened to have claws on its wings. If it has feathers, it's a bird, believe me. Um, so now we have evolutionist Stanley, uh, Stephen Stanley, making a statement that is made by many uh, uh, evolutionists, admitting honestly that the fossil record fails to document a single example uh, of evolution accomplishing transition uh, and hence offers no evidence that the model can be valid. So again, uh, honest evolutionists <laughs> admit that well, we don't have any evidence for transitional forms. <clears throat> and uh, this, uh, Mary Leakey was a famous paleontologist. Um, she died 20 some years ago, but she said all those trees of life, the branches of our ancestors, talking about human evolution, she says that's a lot of nonsense. So she didn't even <laughs> agree with what her family was finding. Um, soft tissue and fossils is another uh, support for creation. The evolutionists, again, will look at this evidence and say, hmm, how did that soft tissue last 65 million years? You know, they, they've got this mindset because of worldview that evolution is true, therefore, since dinosaurs died 65 million years ago, how did that soft tissue last that long? But scientists have always known that things, soft tissue like collagen, doesn't last that long. And of course, it fits the young Earth from a creationist point of view. Uh, Mount St. Helens is a great example of a catastrophe. It happened in 1980, blew, the mountain blew its top. Uh, a lot of rock layers were formed very quickly in a matter of hours and then hardened within just a few years. Um, canyons were formed. Uh, there's one canyon up there called the uh, Mini Grand Canyon, uh, a couple hundred feet deep. But um, all these all these geologic features were created very quickly, very rapidly, not, not millions of years, but in a matter of months or a few years. Um, there were some lava domes that were formed at, in 1986 after the uh, explosion in 1980, and they took the rocks, creationists took the uh, lava rocks to a, to a lab to have them dated, and they didn't tell them where they came from. 
So they were dated at anywhere from uh, half a million to almost three million years old. <laughs> Yet these rocks formed in 1986. So, and there's many, many examples of this. Um, so if anybody tells you, oh, we know how old the Earth is because we've dated the rocks, that's nonsense. Mm -hmm. We don't know because the, the evidence shows that uh, when we do know the age of the rock, they get it wrong. So if we don't know the age of rock, why should, why should we believe they're right? One other thing about helium, too, another good uh, evidence for creation is the diffusion of helium coming from the rocks and going out into the atmosphere. Uh, they've measured the diffusion rate. They know what the diffusion rate. They, they know uh, about how much helium is there. It all points back to about 6,000 years and not you know, millions or billions of years. <clears throat> Radiocarbon dating, I've got to finish this up real quick. But this is this is really huge because a lot of people say, well, radiocarbon dating proves evolution. The problem is that they're basing it on a false assumption. The false assumption is that the carbon 14, carbon 12 ratio has been the same for a long time, but actually it is still rising. And the reason that's important is that the guy that invented this carbon dating method saw that and ignored it and, and chalked it up to instrument error because he had a mindset and a worldview of evolution. He said, there's no way that, that this is still rising. It had, it's been steady for millions of years, so he threw it out. Uh, but it's true, and, and carbon-14 is rising, and you can see, if you can see on the black curve, you know, it shows it rising. It hadn't even gotten to equilibrium yet with the decay, equalizing the decay. Um, but the evolutionists just assumes it's always been the same. Well, the bottom line is that that's gonna throw your dates off. So radiocarbon dates, you probably can, if you see a radiocarbon date in the literature, divide it by 10, and that's probably closer to what it really is. <clears throat> so in summary, um, I believe this is an important issue, particularly because of our young people and the way they're being taught and what they're following in the universities. Uh, it's not religion versus science, it's a worldview issue. Um, creation, I believe, more faithful to God's word and uh, more reasonable scientifically. That theistic evolution, people that try to combine uh, creation and evolution, those that put science first, like William Lane Craig and, and Piper and Keller and all those folks, really most of our Christian colleges, unfortunately, that undermines the Bible. Because once you open yourself up to evolution and millions of years or whatever, you're throwing out the need for a creator. You say, oh, we don't, need, we don't need God, we don't need a creator. Everything evolved, everything came about naturally. And you're just undermining the faith of many. Uh, the Big Bang Theory has many problems. Uh, life could never arise from non-life, we know that. In fact, the evolution, a lot of evolutionists now are saying that life was seeded by aliens from outer space. That, that is the, one of the standard new uh, theories because they know it couldn't have evolved here. Um, epigenetic research, I mentioned that, just some really neat stuff going on, cutting edge uh, research right now, and of course fossils and the dating method of rocks just aligns with, uh, with creation uh, a lot better than evolution. That's it. Will you say a prayer for us, John? I'm sorry? Will you say a prayer for us? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Holy Father, we come to you now, uh, a very needy people, uh, people who want to glorify you and your word. Uh, Lord, uh, we thank you for what you've shown us, um, most of all in your word, but even, even in uh, creation and nature, we see your power and your majesty uh, throughout. And uh, Lord, help us to glorify you uh, for what you've done as creator. Help us to share this with others. Help us to um, honor you uh, with our lives and how we live. But to take these things as foundational truths that uh, we need to pass on to our young people. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this time. Thank you for these men who desire to serve you. And, and uh, Lord, I pray your blessing upon everyone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
to Christian radio, there's another discovery that shows that the earth is real, creation is real, God is real, the word is correct. I mean, it's not, they don't find things that refute this. They find things that can't say it's true. Uh, so anyway, thanks for coming. Don't forget the pickle jar. Sonny's always good to us. And next week we have my, my pastor coming to speak, Pastor Mark, Mark Ragsdale. Y'all be sure to show up to see him. Thank y'all. Thank you very much.